Canada is spending billions building a separate passenger rail network between Toronto and Quebec City. But building a separate new line is not unusual. Governments around the world are spending the big bucks building bullet trains with speeds in excess of 300 kilometers per hour. And this is a class of train that typically requires a lot of new infrastructure anyway. So new lines often get built, like the United Kingdom's high-speed route from London to Manchester, Germany's expanded Karlsruhe to Basel line, and, of course, America's new middle of nowhere to middle of nowhere success story. Good job, America. All our G7 peers are at it, as well as overachievers like India, Morocco, and Uzbekistan. So it's about time for Canada to join them. And that's why we have our grand plan to build a slow network between Toronto and Quebec City. So why slow train? Well, it's because of no train. The joke in Canada is that we're the best at high-speed rail studies. You can see a range of 25 studies at the website for the advocacy group High Speed Rail Canada, where an ever-aging Paul Langan passes year after frustrating year sand shovel in the ground. So how did high-speed studies give us a low-speed train? Well, the last big Fed study for the Quebec City to Windsor Corridor Ecotrain was released in 2011. Around this time in Alberta, a high-speed line was also being discussed, and the airline and intercity bus industry show up on the public record lobbying against it. But in Canada, lobbying still does require justification. It's not quite the campaign contributions for inside influence going on to the south. So what could a lobbyist whisper into the ears of our government in the early 2010s? We don't know what they said, but there's lots of good points that they could have made. The first is funding. High-speed rail is a premium product. Despite the first bullet train arriving in 1964, only 20,000 kilometers or so of it existed by 2011. No one had really figured out how to build a lot of it cheaply. Because high-speed rail is expensive and the government's budget is limited, it's not hard to find something, even rail transportation related, that also deserves funding and then lobby, hey, high-speed rail is great, but with a limited budget, how about this other project? That's what happened with the mayors of Edmonton and Calgary who made submissions in line with the airline industry in Alberta. Their two highly car-dependent cities wanted the money to instead be spent on their light rail lines to create a user base for high-speed rail later. The second point that a lobbyist could make in 2011 was demographic. Sure, over half of Canada's population lives in the Quebec-Windsor corridor, but with 15.9 million people living in 18 different census metro areas spread over a thousand kilometers. It may be Canada's equivalent of a Northeast corridor in the United States, which does have a high-speed train, but it's not an equivalent in population. We don't even have the population of the New York metro area across our whole corridor. And finally, let's be realistic. It's hard to get the stars to align in a federated first-past-a-post political system. When one party gets in at the provincial or federal level, local ridings flip, creating a constantly changing political calculus on any railway project. It takes decades to go from study to commissioning a high-speed rail line, and each time a high-speed project gets cancelled, you hit reset and start the process again. Countries like the UK, Australia, and the US, which share these electoral problems, are also notable high-speed rail stragglers. So after the last study in 2011 went nowhere fast, VIA came up with what is essentially the minimum viable product of improved rail service. The CEO of VIA, Yi Desjardins Cicillino, started to talk about what was to become high-frequency rail in 2015. High-frequency rail adds some linguistic flourish to mundane conventional rail. High speed, high frequency, two equally valid options. But it's a communication strategy. It fully emerged the following year as a package of mundane, but at least dedicated conventional rail lines between Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec City. High frequency rail was always a bit of a weird plan. Nobody calls a train high frequency rail. More electric, high speed rail, more uh, high frequency rail. Generally, trains in places that they don't suck, they're frequent, but they're also fast, so that the important part of the train, you know, competing with driving, competing with flying, getting to the place you want to go, that doesn't suck. But after the Ecotrain report amounted to nothing, and Ontario cancelled plans for its own high-speed rail, many reluctantly got on board with the high-frequency train. It was the only improvement anyone was seriously suggesting. But those slow wheels were not the only thing in motion. Canada got on a fast growth path. It became, and still is, the fastest growing member of G7, something that isn't slowing anytime soon. 
Those new Canadians are causing substantial increases in the urban populations of Toronto, Montreal and Ottawa, as well as extensive rapid transit investment at a scale never seen before in Canada. Remember that municipal preference to invest high-speed rail funding elsewhere in Alberta? Well, to their credit, Edmonton and Calgary followed through and developed a ton of well-used light rail with those provincial funds. Across the country, cities have been creating demand for car-free intercity transportation options. Canada is a changing country. The half a million people are moving here every year, and generally they don't just pack up their car and they throw it under the plane and, and bring it over with them. People generally arrive here without a car, and a lot of people are living without a car because we've got all of this high-density housing that's getting built and all of the new urban mass transit. If you don't own the car, it's a lot easier to make the case for the train. But more than just demographic numbers started dating the plan. High-speed rail also matured as a technology Countries like Spain show that it could be done much cheaper than before. The length of high-speed rail in the world tripled in the decade following the Ecotrain report. All these changes haven't just undermined the opposition, the opposition has fragmented. Discount airlines emerged as a real threat in the intervening years and drained the profitability of the Toronto to Montreal route. But the airline most threatened by a high-speed train from downtown Toronto isn't the incumbents, it's Porter, whose business is mostly based on the Toronto Island Airport. For Air Canada and WestJet, the enemy of a growing existential threat would be this line running at high speed. So the lobby is less united and each year has worse reasons to give a politician who should be able to see at this point that high speed rail has the wind in its sails. But high speed rail isn't just gaining political support because the opposition lobby is weakened, or even the boost it gets from the ascending climate change movement, it also has its own corporate champions. They were actually the first stop made by Yi when he suggested the dedicated rails project. Canadian public-private partnerships have developed over the last decade and created powerful coalitions of engineering, construction and train manufacturers held together with the financial firepower of Canada's unusually ambitious and infrastructure-oriented pension funds. And for many of them, going bigger is better. After setting things in motion, Yi left Via in 2019 with the project underway. But where was it going? The original dedicated rails project pitch made use of existing freight rails. This works because, after all, high frequency rail was all about getting up and running fast, not going fast, with reliable service on the cheap. Dedicated tracks running at conventional speed has a low execution risk and therefore a faster time to market. The route departs from Toronto and takes this existing Canadian Pacific line all the way up through Peterborough to Havelock, then rebuilds from scratch an old line, which is currently a rail trail, from there to Glen Tay, after which new lines will probably be built along the highway to Smith's Falls. And then it's on to Via's existing infrastructure, up to Ottawa, and down onto an existing freight corridor into Montreal. Is this a good route for that conventional speed goal? Sure. Via used to run a train from Havelock which went at pretty similar speeds to the present day commuter rail run by the government of Ontario. With quite a bit of work, they could get this rail line up to those speeds of around 200 kilometers an hour that the government is aiming for. But this route commits to those more conventional, not high speeds, which is hard to see until we zoom in. Have a look at this section that is currently a trail weaving between lakes. Curves like this will not allow high-speed trains, which need a radius of several kilometers. Straightening the lines, blasting and tunneling and bridging and filling in lakes is prohibitively expensive both economically and politically. Now compare that to the freight lines running to the south, where you can see the straighter lines of the corridor. This is because simpler geography and over a century of infrastructure upgrades have incrementally ironed out a straighter route. But again, this route through Peterborough, proposed in 2015, was chosen because we're being pragmatic, buying some cheap lines and getting... ...the third of the cost for two-thirds of the benefit of a high-speed rail proposal. But even before Yves departed, the proposal took on a life of its own. The private sector he was talking to here apparently wasn't interested enough to fund the project in its entirety, so the project was going to have to adapt and succeed politically. The first change, after telling the private sector... We're talking about Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, strictly Toronto, Ottawa and Montreal. ...was to add in Quebec City, to get that political buy-in and ensure that both Upper and Lower Canada got an equal piece of the action. This immediately destroyed the fiscally prudent pillar, massively increasing the cost of a project for minimal ridership gains. A joint project office founded in 2019 scoped out various models and decided to go with a public-private partnership using a co-development model. 
Co-development means that different private sector entities are going to work with the government in a collaborative sense to develop the project. Instead of saying, build us a bridge across this river and give us a price each time we use it, it's more like, how do you think we should get across this river? So basically the plans circle back to the very first people that weren't interested in 2015. And they had some notes. When the initial request for expressions of interest was released, every construction, engineering firm, and pension fund showed up, including Alstom, the French train equipment manufacturer. With Quebec's infrastructure-focused pension fund as its largest shareholder, it was a voice that the government could not ignore. During the first request for interest, Alstom expressed a pretty clear interest in building high-speed rail instead of this weird thing. And they lobbied hard with all the reasons that you could. The things that advocates in Canada have been saying for decades. Merging employment markets, climate change, and the substantial ridership increases that come with beating cars and planes. They got large support sign-ons from the business and political community in Quebec and Ontario. Their proposal looked a lot like the Northeast Corridor in the United States, mixing high speed in where it was easy to set up rail where it's strongest as the king of medium distance travel. A tidal rail reclaimed in the last century, thanks in part to Alstom, one of the key players in France's success story. 380 km So who would oppose the French? The Germans, of course. Siemens showed up as a large and serious alternative, and they clearly supported the conventional rail solutions already envisioned by CEO Yves Desjardins Cicillino. It was gonna be cheaper. It was gonna be built quicker. And if that's not true, then I'm not Yves Desjardins Cicillino. Yeah, that's right. The former CEO of Via had left his job to work for Siemens, the train manufacturer that he had just bought 32 conventional train sets from when he worked for Via. And if he could get his way, he'd get many more added to that order. You see, that's what's really going on. Two companies slogging it out in the lobbying sphere to increase their profits. Alstom has North America's only train capable of going 300 kilometers an hour. It took them years to make that happen. But it is now their competitive advantage in a bid. They are the kings of speed on the continent. On the other hand, Siemens is the most dominant manufacturer of conventional passenger trains in North America. They're the conventional speed specialists. Both companies already have huge factories building their respective trains in North America, and adding more orders to the list is all upside. Sure, I think hiring Eves is a bad look for Siemens. It's like he ran alongside, helpfully pushing the German bobsled and then jumped in for the ride. Just, I guess, <laughs> much slower. But they're a company trying to make money and Alstom is too. Both companies are trying to do what they need to maximize their chances of winning the bid. But they have exposed what is right and what is wrong with how this is rolling out. So first of all, some constraints are just too relaxed. It's great that the process allowed Alstom to put high-speed rail back on the table, but now that it has, we have to choose one. We don't want two co-developers with one pitching a vision of conventional rail and the other a vision of high-speed rail. That's just too broad a mandate. The government's current fix for this is asking the consortiums to submit both a low and higher speed proposal. Making them split their time between two different proposals only to throw one in the shredder doesn't seem like it will give us the best outcome. We have to decide and commit. Are we doing high-speed rail or not? And then on the other hand, if we actually are open to doing high-speed, some of the constraints are too specific for that to be done well. Being open to high-speed rail while still requiring the route to go through the speed-limiting curves of the Peterborough and Canadian Shield route is like a father being open to seeing his kids on the weekend but then moving to another continent. Bad parenting, bad planning. In Alstom's high-speed proposal, Peterborough to Toronto remains at conventional speed, so the train will look aerodynamic and fast, but be stuck traveling at go train speeds. It's great for Peterborough to get rail, like I really mean that. Build a go train line out there, it would be a, a valuable thing. But I think it's silly to say that this is a good thing, and a better rail line to Montreal is a good thing, and for some reason, they have to be one thing. These things can be independently good things, and if you combine them, you might get this bastardized, terrible project that doesn't do either very well, and that, that seems like such an obvious thing to avoid, and we're just sort of walking right into that trap. It's the Peterborough principle, where a conventional rail line is actually a better service for the community than making it the slow tail end of a high-speed line. 
run high speed rail down the corridor where it can actually go fast the whole way and give Peterborough a cheaper and more frequent GO train line that gets them to Toronto in the same amount of time. The high frequency rail proposal has changed over time into a creature that is unrecognisable from the sensible thing that was originally conceived in 2015. It's not going the same places, costing the same amount, or now even potentially going the same speed, and nor should it. Things have changed over the last decade, and so should the plan, but it's not adapting, it's warping, it's collapsing under the vestigial tails of earlier iterations of the plan. The federal government, who is funding this, needs to do a reset and straighten out the parameters so that they make sense and set beating the car and the aeroplane as criteria. Because it's getting harder and harder to understand why Canada is spending this much money doing a once in a generation project to achieve the shameful title of being the only G7 country that is polluting more while also being the only G7 country left in the world building a slow intercity passenger rail network. When Yves Desjardins Cicilino first presented his plan for Via's slow but dedicated rail project in 2015, he rounded out his presentation with a quote. SNCF uh, president in 1971 said, rail will be the transportation mode of the 21st century if it survives the 20th. The irony is Louis Armand didn't say that in 1971. That's when he died. He actually said that in the 1950s. But he still had a better vision for the future than Yves. He wasn't talking about saving railways by running frequent trains. SNCF had just broken the world speed record by running a train at 331 kilometers an hour. Louis Armand could see the bright and fast future of rail if they could just get the political willpower together to get it built. In the early 1990s, one of Louis Armand's successors declared the French high-speed TGV project the train that saved French railways. And here we are, Canada the 21st century, and Louis Armand's train Grand Vitesse is ready to help save us too. Save